All right, we are now recording. Let me just go over quickly, if I can do anything quickly. These, uh, oh, Justin decided he would be here today. Yeah. All right. Anyone else come in that I didn't see? Or even someone I did see but didn't mark? Okay. Two weeks from yesterday, uh, Wednesday, February the 12th, from 9.30 to 11.30, they'll have the college transfer day, fair days on the uh, Birmingham West Campus in the academic building, that's B Hall, all lined up up and down the hall there at tables uh, will be a bunch of schools. They've invited many, many schools. I don't know how many will show up. Then the next day, two weeks from today, it'll be on this campus, this building, um, 9.30 to 11.30, same as before. This time they said in the college cafeteria, I just doubt they can fit everybody in there or even would want to at the end of breakfast, beginning of lunch. That just seems like a little crazy. I'm guessing it's going to be in the faculty staff dining room. No, hardly anyone uses that except for meetings and stuff. So I bet you that's where it's going to be. Now, if they can't fit everybody there, then they may move a few into the cafeteria or into the hallway outside of there. Okay. Now, the other thing is for people who are uh, thinking of engineering, uh, especially mechanical, electrical, or material engineering, there is a great uh, research program for a 10-week uh, internship this summer uh, at three universities, University of Arkansas, Illinois, and Howard University. They are looking for to recruit minority engineering students to work there, and they it's a great system. They pay $5,000 for you to go. You receive free housing, which I think includes re free food. They pay you to get, they pay your airfare there and back one time, and uh, it's just a fantastic opportunity sponsored by the uh, National Science Foundation. So if anyone knows of anyone interested, let them know. Deadline on the letter it said, on the email it said February the 15th, which I found a little strange because that's a Saturday, but then on the brochure it said February 17th, which is Monday, which makes more sense. Get the applications in early if you can. All right. Any questions from anything we've done so far? All right. There are a couple of uh, announcement type things for this class I want to make. I finally heard back, I've been calling every office hour that I had, Monday and Wednesday, uh, trying to get in touch with the guy over at Samford. He called back, I think it was this morning, my work study student took the phone call and she said that he, they are not doing any shows at, at Samford. The lady said she thought he was doing some occasionally, he said no, they're not doing any. So that's out, sorry about that. but. That go, covers part of my eye exam and stuff like this, so that helps us keep from getting behind there. All right. Now, what are we doing today? We're in Chapter 17. Uh, we finished the minerals part. We're in the rocks part. And we don't have that many more. I think we can easily finish in this next... Uh, you know, two hours or so. So the last two hours today will be the lab for Chapter 17. The lab for 17 is a computer lab. Uh, I'll have to find the lab to take us to. I think I know the one I want to use. Uh, well, I have a first choice, a second choice, and then I'll use whatever else I can come up with. Uh, but usually by this time in the afternoon, the, there's labs available. So I'll find one. I didn't have any time this morning to go around and look. Uh, so we'll be doing that. If you have your own laptop, you can probably do it from there, possibly from your phones. Uh, it might be hard to read everything you need from your phones, but uh, I will get a computer lab and we'll go from there. Okay. If we do finish Chapter 17 today, which I think we will, that means the test for 17 will be Tuesday, uh, the last 30 minutes on Tuesday. Hopefully we'll get started in 18 today, 
and maybe we'll get far enough along uh, so we can have the lab for 18 on Tuesday as well. well. Let's just see how far we go. Sorry I'm late getting started this time, but like I said, the registrar came by, caught me right before I was leaving the office, needing me to review a transcript with her to tell her what, which of our courses matched the ones that this person had taken somewhere else that she wasn't familiar with that school. So that took longer than I intended. I didn't intend it to happen at all. All right, first, any questions or anything we've covered so far? All right, at the <clears throat> end of the last class, we had just gotten into the rocky part of the course, of the chapter. What were our three basic classification of rocks? Say again? Sedimentary is one. Say again? Okay, granite is a type of rock, but what's the classification of rock? Igneous, sedimentary, and M. Metamorphic. Metamorphic. Change drop, basically. Okay. What's that? Those are the three biggest classifications of rock. Just about every rock will fall into one of those three. Uh, now, Let's talk about igneous. Where does igneous come from? Say again. Where does igneous come from? Hot magma. Hot magma, you got it. Okay, right there. Formed from magma either above or below the Earth's surface. Okay? If this magma has made it to the Earth's surface, that's going to cool very rapidly. Some of that could be underwater. And some of it could be in the air, but that will cool very, very rapidly. If it's deep enough under the Earth's surface, it will cool very slowly. So this will create different types of rock, igneous rock. Here's a good statement. All rocks were at one time igneous rocks. Later when we get into sedimentary rocks, we'll see that sedimentary rocks are formed from sediments of pieces of other rocks, many of which were igneous rock. Okay? Metamorphic rock could be igneous rock that has been changed, transformed. So all rock, all rock that you see at one time was igneous rock. The cooling rate determines the texture. Now we have several words that we use for texture. We, we will refer to it as coarse or fine. Coarse meaning grainy, fine meaning very small grains, okay? Um, so we'll use several words there. The cooling rate is usually rapid or slow, and that has various degrees as well. Now, if those rocks were formed below the Earth's surface, think of this as interior, then they are called intrusive. Inside the earth, intrusive igneous rock formed beneath the earth's surface. Generally, they were slow cooling because they're in the earth's surface. They're not going to cool rapidly. They will cool quite slowly. If they cool slowly, what kind of grain do they have or texture? Cool slowly, large crystals, which is coarse grain. Cooling slowly is large <coughs> crystals, which are coarse grain. Let me see if I can find David. Yeah, he's here. Okay. Anyone else come in since I called off? Okay. So, a slow cooling process produces large crystals, and this will form coarse grain rock. Okay. We'll see some of those when y'all are doing the lab. I have some samples of rock out there. Okay? Now, those are intrusive inside the earth, cooling, the magma is cooling slowly, forming large crystals. If they make their way to the surface, they have exited the thing, so they're extrusive igneous rock. Those that have exited the, the confines of the earth and have made it to the surface. Either 
Uh, by the way, uh, just in case you haven't picked up on this, magma, if it's below the Earth's surface, it's called magma. If it reaches the Earth's surface, it's called lava. Okay? If it reaches the Earth's surface, either underwater or uh, in the air, that forms lava on the surface. These cool very rapidly, and if they're rapid cooling, small crystals and what we call fine-grained uh, uh, rock, igneous rock. Now here is a picture of granite. There is another one in your text, though it looks like this has been perhaps magnified some. This is actually a picture of a piece of granite. Now it's hard to read this writing, I know from where you are. Granite is Coarse grain, coarse grain meaning is large crystal size, slow cooling rate, intrusive igneous rock. So granite is coarse grain. That tells you a lot. Uh, can't read that word there. Let's see if I can find it in the book. Yeah, coarse grain, igneous rock, composed mostly of, now this is mostly, light colored minerals. Okay, now remember, minerals are the individual uh, creations. Rocks are made up of a mixture, a combination of minerals. Okay, so the whitest kind of minerals there that you see are probably quartz, possibly some mica, that kind of stuff. The tannish color, uh, they could be horn blends, or, not horn blend, uh, uh, plagioclase or some of those kinds of rocks. Uh, uh, the dark little specks there are probably specks of biotite. But all these are fairly large crystal sizes, which means they were intrusive igneous rock. They cooled slowly, forming large crystal sizes. Now, this you can't really see the crystal size too much, but that's true of this. Now, if an extrusive, if magma comes up to the surface and cools way too quickly, like underneath very, very cold water, it's going to cool very quickly, probably not time enough to form decent crystal structure at all. It could happen above the uh, surface in air too. If it cools way too quickly, then it may not even form crystals. Then they will not be minerals. It will be a rock, but it just won't be made up of minerals. It will be made up of other materials. And this is a picture of obsidian. We talked about this with Game of Thrones type thing. Um, let's see if I can read this. This is a piece of obsidian which has the exactly the same chemical structure as granite. These two chemically are identical. This, however, is a rock made out of coarse crystal size. That is what they call a volcanic glass, or just a glass. Obsidian cooled very quickly, probably above the surface of the earth, possibly underwater somewhere. Same way granite, same materials that granite would make, but it didn't form regular crystals because it cools so quickly, and that gives it this glassy kind of sheen and texture. Okay? Um, I thought that picture was in your book, too. Yeah, it is over on page... 17.4. It's a different view of a slightly different piece. It's a piece of obsidian which has the same chemical composition of granite, which is one you see there. Obsidian has a different texture because it does not have crystals. It's a volcanic glass. The curved fracture surface is common in non-crystal su substances such as glass. Uh, pretty good size chunk of it, you see the quarter there next to it. This picture doesn't have the quarter I don't, that I can see. Okay. 
So, <clears throat> there's the foundational part of igneous rock. Two basic forms of igneous rock, intrusive, extrusive. Okay? Intrusive, cooled slowly, large crystal size, coarse grain. All those things go together. Extrusive igneous rock form outside the surface of the earth, small crystal size, rapid cooling, small crystal size, possibly even no crystals. Glass, volcanic glass. Okay. Any questions on the basic slide for igneous rock? All right. So, how do we classify? Here's some other ways you classify igneous rock. Intrusive, extrusive, here are the factors that we consider. Number one, what is the mineral composition of this igneous rock? And number two, which we talked about before, the texture of the igneous rock. Now, here are the two basic mineral composition combinations. Either it's high in iron or low in iron, which is non-ferrous composition, or it's high in iron, which is called ferromagnetic composition. Now, the figure they're talking about is this one. Now, this is a really has a lot of information in it, uh, but it's a fairly complicated slide. Okay, uh, let's start with the non-ferrous, because that's where they start here. This is on the left side of the figure, okay? Now, because it is low in iron, the mineral composition is low in iron, there's some iron in it. You see, even as far over here as you do, you've got a little bit of iron. See, this, what they colored green here really should be black, but if they did it black, you couldn't read the words, okay? So this should be black and it should be darker here and getting a little bit lighter like the green gets lighter as you go over. That little bit's a biotite. That's why I said those speckles in the granite would be mostly biotite. Okay? It's just a mineral, an iron mineral. But more, that would only be like one or two percent of this here. Now it could be down as much as 70 to 75 percent here. But that still would be low iron content. I'm sorry, 20, 25% to 26% iron, okay? Um, that would that covers this range. And as I said, the brownish color, and this is more correct, these are your plagioclases, your feldspars, those kinds of things. But then even lighter than them, but still sort of in the brown range, is potassium feldspar, orthoclase. But the clear and the uh, colorless, whitish color is mostly quartz. Okay? Now, so these on this side would be your non ferrous um, mineral composition. Now, you can't say anything about the texture from here, so they just list it up here. The coarse grain, low iron, low density, and that's the other thing here, low in density, meaning fairly lightweight, light in color, because you have these light colored minerals in them. Granite is the most common example. But granite is intrusive igneous rock, large crystal size, slow cooling rate, so that would be granite. And that's a very common non-ferrous uh, uh, igneous rock that you find on the surface of the earth. Much of the, okay, have we talked about this yet? <clears throat> Not yet, but we'll, we'll pick it up later. Uh, much of the continental crust is made up of granite. They have large granite mines. Have any of you ever been to or been around or know about Stone Mountain in Georgia? That's just a huge chunk of granite exposed. Okay, now, I don't like what it exposes, but it is there, and, and it exposes. They do a lot of, uh, most of the gravel that you get in Georgia, granite, you, large crystal size. We have gravel in our house over, our 
the parking area and stuff like this of a house we just have gravel in it over in Georgia and you can just see big big crystal size in that okay if the fine grain that still has uh, crystals that's rhyolite now I'm sure I've seen some rhyolite but I probably couldn't pick it out I do know it would be fine grain light colored low density um, whether I'd pick it out or not I don't know but if it didn't get any grains in it, then it would be a glass and that's obsidian. That would be in the same group that this doesn't. This is only including those who have crystals on it. And you wouldn't be naming the crystals down here. Okay. So low density, in other words, lightweight, light in color, okay? These are your uh, non-ferrous uh, uh, igneous rocks. The ferromagnetic ones are those that are more to the right, okay? The higher in density, why? Because iron is heavier than silica, okay? Much heavier than silica, okay? So therefore, your, your uh, the rocks on this side of the table will be much higher density. Just to show you what I'm talking about, Here's iron down here, here's silicon over here. I'm sorry. Silicon right here. I was over too far. Silicon here, iron down here. Much higher density. Okay? Now, uh, greater density, darker color. The One of your primary examples of this is basalt. Now, basalt is a fine grain uh, igneous rock. That meant it was extrusive. It cooled near the surface. Many times your basalts are the ones that cooled underwater. Because much of your oceanic crust, which we're talking about in a later chapter, is made out of basalts. Volcanic activity that cooled very quickly underwater. The, and you, I'll show you examples of this. When we had our master bathroom redone upstairs, we were beginning to have such bad mold coming through the tile. We didn't know why, so uh, we just decided to redo it. When they redid it, they found out why. The people didn't put the foundation under it they should have, so you were just having mold growing right through the grout. It wasn't that we were, it was growing into the ground, it was growing through the ground out. We had a really good uh, mason who did the work of craftsmen of the highest order, and he really fixed it the way it was supposed to be done. Okay? Uh, but he said we had chosen some, you know, just some tans and some browns and what, you know, it was sort of light color. He said, oh, Go get me some black granite and bring it in so I can do a little contrast. He was, like I said, he was a craftsman. And uh, I said, black granite, and this is before I taught this course. And he said, uh, yeah, you can find this. So I went to the store and asked for black granite. Oh, yeah, here's some. So I sold it to him. Well, later I mentioned that to my niece, who was actually working on a master's in geography and geology. She said, there's no such thing as black granite. Well, that's what he called it. Well, there's no such thing as black granite. Well, then the next year I started teaching this course, and as soon as I got it, I found out there's no such thing as black granite because granite, by definition, is light colored. What they were talking about was basalt. Yeah. They call it black granite, but it's really not. It's basalt. And it's very different from granite in that, it, number one, it's darker, it's denser, and it's fine grain, whereas granite is coarse grain. Okay, so this would be extrusive igneous rock, intrusive igneous rock. Ferrous magnetic, non-ferromagnetic. Okay, mm -hmm. lots of differences. Well, medical use of basalt has. Say that again. What medical purpose does basalt have? I don't know of any, but you think there is some medical? I think I saw it somewhere. I don't know. Okay. But it's more on top of it, in the earth. Yeah, on top, yeah, on, on the surface, yeah. 
either above, either underwater or in the air. And it, it forms pretty fast. When it, very, very fast cooling. cooling so it's right. small crystal, uh, crystal size, fine grain. That's what. Small crystal size, fine grain. Those mean the same thing. Okay. Now, you have stuff in between. You just sort of have to go with it, whether it's considered uh, ferromagnetic on this side or non-ferrous on that side. They do give a couple of, oh, when we did the countertops over in our, the, at the farm in Georgia, we chose a, a dark stone when we saw it. It has large crystal size. You can see the crystals very easily there. I said, that must be gabbro. And later when my niece came, she said, oh, nice piece of gabbro. Oh, I got it right. Okay. So, uh. That was her area. So Gabbro would be like granite, except it's very uh, high density, dark color, ferromagnetic, as opposed to um, granite, which is uh, low density, lighter color, and non-ferromagnetic. Okay. Other things that this table shows, of course, increasing silica going this way, okay, Silica being your quartzy material, so you see. Uh, but remember, silica, any of your silicates are going to have in it, so these are all silicates, okay? Um, so increasing silica going that way, decreasing coming this way. Increasing potassium and sodium as you go to the lighter side. Increasing calcium, iron, and magnesium as you come this way. That's why they call it ferromagnetic. That has nothing to do with being magnetic. The magnetic part is from magnesium. Now, don't, don't confuse this. They love to express the metals in terms of oxides. Most of the time they're not oxides. K2O is fairly rare. Na2O is fairly rare. I mean, it's not that it doesn't exist. CaO is, I mean, these are, they just put the oxides here. Why did they say increasing potassium and sodium, increasing calcium, iron, and magnesium? I don't know. They put the O's on there just like they did here. Silica dioxide is probably silicates, not necessarily silica dioxide. So don't worry about the oxides there. You don't need to know that, but you're... Uh, if you remember Bowen's uh, reaction uh, illustration we had, those things that come out of the, the magma at higher temperatures, deeper in the earth, these are the ones down here. Higher iron, higher magnesium, higher calcium. Those that wait a long time to become solidified at low, cooler temperatures, these are more potassium and sodium, especially in the feldspars, okay? And certainly in the silica, where you have almost pure quartz coming out. Quartz is an igneous rock. Uh, it, actually, it's an igneous mineral, okay? And you'll have a high quartz content in many of your granites. But, get this, some of your granites can be very dark, having a like I said, 26% iron, up to that, not much more than that. Uh, large quantities of feldspars, plagioclase, um, and, uh, uh, and you know, some potassium feldspar, with very little quartz, very little of the whiteness in it. And you'll see, at least what they call, a, a very dark, a very brown granite, because that it covers a pretty wide range there. Okay. All right, that's it for igneous rock. Okay, second kind of rock, and by the way, before we move on here, um, there is a nice size blurb, Science and Society, on cost of mining mineral resources. Okay. 
it's interesting read. Uh, I, you know, that's all just for your interest. There are also a couple of examples here, um, and it's sort of interesting to, to look at this using this very table we just left. Uh, igneous rock classification is based on proportion of the minerals present in the rock is shown in the fields containing the mineral names in figure 17.3, which is that one, okay? 17.13, sorry. For a given igneous rock name, this proportion varies based on the silica content. Is read from percentages on the y-axis of the chart. Okay. And this is Antonio, right? Now, based on 1713, that one that we're looking at now, what is the range in percentages of each mineral in granite? Okay, that's what they're asking. Well, quartz ranges from zero to, it looks like, about 30 or 35 percent, down to almost zero percent. Okay. Potassium feldspar, which you could also name uh, orthoclase, that goes from, let's just say that was 35% up to 90%. So that would be about 65, no, 55. Yeah, about 55% uh, plagioclase, potassium feldspar, or orthoclase here down to almost zero percent. Sodium-rich plasma clay would go from, that could be as little as maybe five percent down to, goodness gracious, almost 70 percent. And the biotype or a little bit of an amphibole, uh, amphibole, I guess is how you say it, could go from as little as one or two percent down to as much as 25, 26%, no, 26, 27%. So let's see how they did it. They said 5% uh, biotite was the minimum on the high silicate side uh, and up to 30, um, 5 to 30% range uh, from the low silica boundary, okay? Sodium-rich plagioclase, they said 10% to 70%. Potassium feldspar from 0% to 53%, and quartz anywhere from 0% to 32%. Okay, then they ask you to do the same thing with uh, basalt. Okay, so you can do that as much or as little as you like. Okay, now let's move to sedimentary rock. As the name sort of suggests, sedimentary rocks are formed from particles or dissolved materials. So either particles or dissolved materials from previously existing rocks. <coughs> Those previously existing rocks could have been igneous rock. They could have been other sedimentary rock. They could have been metamorphic rock. Basically what's happened, other rocks have broken down into smaller components, okay, or dissolved away, and then when they reform, they form sedimentary rock. Now the sediments could be one of two kinds, and they only list one kind here, and so we'll come back to this in a minute. But sediments are accumulation of, now here's the, these words, you've probably heard these before, Silt, sand, usually they mention clays, and other materials that settled out of water. Now, the other materials could be stuff that's not even minerals, like seashells or bone fragments or something like that, okay? That wouldn't be classified as minerals. But generally, the silts and the sands and clays are formed from minerals. One of the two types of sediments is called plastic sediments. 
plastic, C-L-A-S-T-I-C, -C, not plastic, but plastic, C instead of P. These are accumulated from rocks at various stages of breaking down. Now, the two chapters from now, no, three chapters from now, we'll talk about how the Earth's surface breaks down. And that forms pieces. Okay? Two ways it breaks down. Some is from particles and others from dissolving. So we're going to be talking about both of them. The classic sediment, plastic sediments come from particles. There is the key. Now this table you're going to see in some form or another a couple of times. So sort of get used to it. Okay? Now. They're talking here about the classic sediments. These are from pieces of rock. And you can, they're going from high to low. I want to go from low to high. Second? Okay. All right. The silts or the clays are the very tiniest particles. Remember when I described to you what a clay particle was? You take that dime and slice it into 1,000 equal slices, that would be one micron. The biggest clay particles you would have would be no bigger than two microns. So that's sub-microscopic. I mean, a microscope's not going to see a clay particle. Whereas a silt particle is something like flour. So fine that it's slick, okay? That would be uh, silts. And... Uh, sedimentary rocks that are made out of those little bitty, little bitty, bitty, bitty pieces of other materials, they will be called siltstone, claystone, and another name is shale. Okay? We're going to talk about shale several times. Uh, one of the, not too far from here, up around Nashville, they have a lot of shale just naturally occurring shale, okay? Uh, so, the next largest size is sand. And the best thing to do with that, the largest piece of sand to be called sand, would be two dimes put together. That would be about two millimeters, okay? I have two dimes, so I'll put them back. Okay, that would be the largest dimension, not thousands of this, but two dimes, that would be the largest dimension of a sand particle, okay, is the thickness of two dimes. And then anything below that down to you get to the flower filling thing, that would be silt, okay? So if you have rocks, sedimentary rocks made up of sand particles, then that's going to be sandstone. Ha! Ah, clever name, huh? Shakaya, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, I'll show you several types of sandstone uh, when we get to the lab, okay? Anything larger than sand, we would normally call gravel or something like that. Um, that forms, if those pieces get pressed together to make sedimentary rock, classic sedimentary rock, they're either conglomerate or breccia. Okay, I assume I'm pronouncing that right. It could be brescia, okay, but I think it's breccia, okay? Now, you'll see this at the bottom of the table in your book. Um, well, the next table in your book, on page 447, table 17.4, conglomerate has rounded fragments, whereas breccia has angular fragments, okay? So that's the difference between these. These are made up of pieces as large as what we would call gravel, and they would be, if it's rounded gravel, that would be conglomerate. <coughs> if it's angular gravel, that would be breccia or breccia. Okay, we'll come back to this slide later and talk about the chemical sediments. But remember it said, these sedimentary rocks are either from particles that's the classic, or from uh, dissolved materials, that's the chemical. So we'll come back to the chemical later. Okay. 
Any questions? Those two have to be combined for you to make a yeah. The, yeah, yeah, sedimentary rock, just like several ways you can classify several of these, but uh, igneous was either extrusive or intrusive, right. mm -hmm. uh, or you could say ferromagnetic or non -fer or non ferrous. Okay, so there's two ways you could look at that with uh, sedimentary rock, two ways that it's formed, either from clastic or chemical. Yeah, clastic are from particles, chemical are from dissolved materials. Okay. Now, here is the, and this is where that I was just reading you from. Uh, here are how you classify um, the classic sediments. I sort of gave it to you before, uh, but clay, and they actually, they, they say the same thing for clay and silt. Clay is much smaller than silt. Clay is submicroscopically small. Silt, you can still see it, okay? Um, and if you were to take 1 and divide it by 256, see what you get. 1 divided by 256, if you got a calculator. 1, one divided by 256. Say again? What, zero, zero, two, nine, or one, nine? Three, nine. Three, nine. What, zero, zero, three, nine? So that's about, what, zero, zero, four. They're saying here four microns. I was saying two microns. The soil classification has a two micron. The engineering classification has a four. But you're still so incredibly tiny. Now, silt is in between that and one sixteenth of a millimeter, which is still pretty small, that is your flower type consistency. Sand is the gritty consistency. Gravel are things bigger than two millimeters and less than uh, uh, 25 centimeters, which is 10 inches, I think. Okay. Uh, and then anything bigger than 10 inches, yeah, 10 inches, there it is. Uh, anything bigger than 10 inches, they call boulders. You don't have many rocks forming, uh, sedimentary rocks forming out of boulders. Maybe boulders would be sedimentary rocks, but you don't have them, those as pieces of your thing. So you use these to make up the sedimentary rock. So they just give you the, uh, the size classification. And the gravel could be either conglomerate, meaning rounded, Gravel pieces are breccia, which are angular uh, pieces. Now they also say siltstone could be called mudstone. Um, it's called shale if it splits along parallel planes. So there, I, I'm not absolutely certain of this, but I'm pretty sure this is true. My wife, when we were building the house over in Georgia, we were thinking about maybe getting a wood stove to put in it. Fireplace just is a little messy, so we were thinking of putting a wood stove. They had it, the design had one, called for one, uh, for a fireplace, but we were going to put uh, that. Um, and we even thought of the, my, her parents' lake house, maybe putting one in there. So she was looking up, and there's a Vermont stove company or something like that, they call theirs soapstone. And when I think of soapstone, I think of something that feels almost slick. That would have to be silt stone. They call it mudstone here. I think another name for it could be uh, soapstone. But I don't know that for sure. But anyway, that's stone. I mean, you feel of it, it has a... But if it's in layers and has that slick feel, then you call that shale. Shale always comes in separable layers, whereas the, the siltstone, mudstone, maybe even soapstone would be just chunks. They wouldn't be layers. So that's the difference in the, the shale. That, the shale is what they have up there around Nashville. Okay. 
What's that? That's not a shell in Alabama. I don't know. I just don't know of any. There may be some in some areas. Now, I know <clears throat> sandstone, especially in sheets, though they don't have a special name for that, that is really big over around Aniana. Uh, we uh, got both what they call rubble or ruble mm -hmm. to build a retaining wall, and it's sort of big chunks of that, or flagstone, which are large dimension this way, but thin this way. Uh, and that's that's the classic place to get it is uh, is uh, around Aniata. Why is Tennessee is so many places? What's that? Tennessee got so many different types of rock there. Well, that's where the Appalachians are. I mean, the so, yeah, the yeah. mountains are there. You just have a lot of choices. You got plenty of flagstone. You got river rocks. You got all. Oh rocks. yeah, yeah. And you got all these rivers up there too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, what are the different types of cemeteries that you already know? Of sedimentary rock? Yeah, like we have limestone, we have sandstone, and Okay, yeah, I mean, all these that were named here. Um, okay, no, no. This is what makes up the claystone, siltstone, and these can be also be called mudstone, maybe soapstone, sandstone, and uh, conglomerate, breccia. Now, these are the plastic made out of particles. We haven't gotten to the. Um, chemical, though it was on this slide, and that's where you saw the limestone, the uh, dolomite, gypsum, and salts. Wait, wait, yeah, the various salts that we have. Uh, those are also sedimentary rock, but these are chemical sediments, things that were dissolved from previous rock and then formed back again when the concentrations increased. Okay, so... We talked about classic sediments, which are made of particles. Very small particles, fairly large particles. Those are various classic sediments. Your chemical sediments would be things that have basically come out of solution and then reformed rock when they re came back together, you might say. Okay, and if you think earlier, when we said most rock come out of liquid forms, either dissolved in water or magma. Well, the magma formed igneous rock, dissolved in water forms chemical sediments, okay? Sedimentary rocks, okay? These form from dissolved rock materials. Three sedimentation paths, okay? Now, this is for chemical sediments, okay? One, the chemical Precipitation from solution. What does precipitate mean to you? Falling. Say again? Falling. I can't hear it. Falling. Falling. That's exactly the right answer. If you said rain, that's because rain falls. Precipitation falls. So a chemical precipitant, okay? I can remember my first chemistry lab when I was a freshman in college. It was a long time ago. <clears throat> the first lab, well, they gave us all the materials and stuff, and the first we had to find unknown materials, and we had this flow chart that we went through. And they gave us two liquids, and we were to do a drop or so from one into the other, some sort of thing. And as soon as you did, they were both clear liquids, and as soon as you dropped that drop into it, a white solid fell out, precipitated. That's what they mean by chemical precipitate. Now, if I'm remembering right, they gave us solutions of silver chloride, no, silver nitrate, and sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is just salt. The silver nitrate stays in solution. Silver chloride does not. So when you mix sodium chloride with silver nitrate, the silver and the chlorine go together and they fall out. They precipitate. So that's one form. Chemical precipitation from solution. Yes. Now, I remember I, uh, my eighth grade class took a trip down to Chattanooga. We went into the Google Call. This is about 200 feet. Oh, 2,000 feet. Okay. I remember my, when I was in my eighth grade class in Chattanooga, we went to Lookout Mountain. So yeah. Underneath it, we, we went down into the caverns where we were following. But the guy told us how to shoot. 
evaporating water. Now remember I said that one, I think last class, if you put your water on the pot that you're going to boil your beans in and you put the salt in it and stuff and you're going to let it come to a boil, then you forgot about it and all the water boiled away, you get big old crystals, not big, but you know, you get crystals of salt stuck on the bottom of the pan because it dissolved and then when the water evaporated it recrystallized. That's the second way that you get chemical sediments. One was chemical precipitants, and the second one is crystallization after evaporate, the water is evaporated away. And then the third one they list here are biological sediments, which they don't really define very well, but what they mean there is kind of some of the same kind of stuff going on there that it is here, but it's mostly biologic in nature. For instance, I think I mentioned to you that the apatite, the phosphate minerals, came from what they call the Bone Ridge or Bone Valley. Central Florida was one place. That used to be underwater, and that's where the, the whale bones and all the other bones settled out when the animals died and settled in there, and then later it was uplifted, and that they, they go way down to get it, but... Uh, that's where they get it. So those would be biological sediments, um, which you might say are not minerals, unless it's been a long time in the process, but these are biological sediments. They don't say a lot about them, but they just mention them. Now, here we have that same chart we've had before, but they're focusing now on the bottom part here. Okay? Chemical sediments, calcite, and like I said, I'll show you some crystals, beautiful crystals of calcite that came out of coal mines, okay? Believe it or not, beautiful white crystals all covered right next to dark city coal, okay? Uh, that's calcite. And my guess on that one is maybe some chemical precipitation, probably more crystallization. Now, if there is any biological component of that, it's so far in the past, I wouldn't even begin to pass about that. But you know that coal did come from living organisms. Okay, another is dolomite, which is a combination of calcite and dolomite, which is calcium carbonate and uh, potassium, I mean uh, uh, magnesium uh, carbonate. Those two together. Okay. Now, calcite, the rock that's formed is limestone, okay? That's a chemical precipitation, probably for out of solution. So, in other words, you get large concentrations of something that calcium dissolves in and another large concentration of something that your uh, carbon dioxide, your carbonate, dissolves in. But when they come together, they come out of solution. That's what forms your limestone whether it's calcitic limestone or dolomitic limestone. Those are both types of limestone. Uh, another chemical um, sedimentary rock is gypsum. Fairly soft rock. Remember, that's one that you can scratch with your fingernail. Uh, and its rock is called the uh, 
Articles are called zips, and, and so is the, the rock. It's soft rock. Okay? And another would be your chemical uh, sedimentary rock would be halite, which is sodium chloride, and these are just salts. Okay? It could be other salts as well. Uh, bromides or chlorides or, or other salts. So it could be a whole, any of your halides. This sodium chloride being probably the most common. That's probably crystallization from the evaporating water. Okay? There's lots of these sort of cross over and mix a bit. Okay, so those are your chemical sediments. Okay. Now, here's some pictures of sedimentary rock. And this is not a particularly great picture in my mind, but this is a picture of limestone. Limestone isn't always that white, uh, but it can be. Um, I can't remember if I have, yeah, I do have some limestone that I'll be showing you. Um, it's a sedimentary rock. What kind of sedimentary? There's two classifications of sedimentary. Plastic or chemical, which is limestone. Chemical, because it comes out of solution. Formed under water. Um, sometimes with the remains of, right there is a seashell. So that's certainly <laughs> uh, organic. That would be a mineral. The limestone is made up of mineral, but it, the rock has uh, other things other than just minerals. There. Okay? Uh, it says, can you find the brachiopod? And that would be the seashell right there. Okay? Now, this is a piece or a picture of what they call, I thought that says mudstone, but now I'm having trouble reading it. No, sandstone. This is a piece of sandstone. This is a sedimentary rock that is not chemical. It's plastic because the pieces in it are sand, sand grains. And if you feel a sandstone, you feel the grip of sand. Okay? So this is sandstone, sedimentary rock, a plastic sedimentary rock from... Goodness, I can't read what that says from the consolidation of sand grains into solid rock, okay? Now, um, it says this sample with iron oxide banding, I think, yeah, banding is from Tasm Tasmania, Australia. I don't know why they chose that one, but what they mean, iron, iron oxide banding, the darker pieces have more iron oxide than them, the darker layers, the lighter layers do not. Okay, so that's why they call it iron oxide banding. Now, here's one of those pieces. This is a regular size. Look at the chunks that make up that rock. That's not sandstone, okay? Those are way bigger than sand particles. This is gravel particles. So this would be either conglomerate or breccia. Now, do you think this is more angular or rounded? No, uh, angular. Look at those. There's some big, sharp angles in there. This would be breccia. This is a piece of breccia, a sedimentary rock that formed from the consolidation of large angular fragments of other previous solid rock. And this could have anything. Some of these pieces could be granite. Some of the pieces could be other sandstone. Some of the pieces could be pieces of metamorphic rock. It could have all sorts of mass in here, all bound together by the sedimentation process. Okay. Which then leads to Oh, wait, here we go. You've seen this at least three times now, okay? Plastic, larger than sand size, breccia, okay? Plastic, 
sand particles, sandstone, right there. We don't have plastic mudstone, siltstone shown here. Chemical, calcite, limestone. Okay? Now you can't see the calcite crystals, or I sure can't, but if you look with a magnifying glass, you probably could pick out the calcite crystals, but it's all bound together. There's probably some quartz in there. There may be some other stuff, and there's certainly organic fragments in there as well. But that's what makes limestone. Okay? Chemical sedimentary rock. All right. Now, how do these... Uh, <coughs> sedimentary rocks form. Now this is mostly, mostly talking about plastic sediments, okay? This is lithification. When you see the prefix lith, wherever you see it, think rock. This is the rock forming process, lithification. Okay, you will see lithification or lith lithosphere. You'll see that show up in later chapters as well. This is the lithification, the rock forming process. Two main parts. The first part is compaction. Now, you first, of course, get the sedimentation down there. You get sediments. Maybe uh, you have a river or a stream or a creek that's flown by uh, and floats by and it's deposited sand, it deposited gravel, it deposited silt or clay. It's made deposits, okay? And those deposits that are made are usually in layers, usually flat horizontal layers, okay? That's not sandstone. That's just layers of particles, okay? That's not rock yet. So the first thing that happens is compaction. And this typically comes when you get layer over layer over layer over layer over layer. Finally, those on the bottom are getting pressed together so tightly, all the water and also pore space that was in between those particles, they're smashed away, okay? That's called compaction, the first step in your lithification process. Before that, it's just layers of gravel or layers of grit or layers of sand or layers of mud, layers of stuff. But when you get way back, it reduces the thickness of the deposit, squeezes out the water, okay? That's part of your compaction. Okay, here's a picture that sort of shows that. When you get the particles that are down there, okay, they're loosely just layered, there. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, layered there, okay, the sedimentation, okay? Now, and you notice here they show some of these are feldspar, some of them are quartz. I don't think that's quartz. These would be quartz, okay? Uh, and you have a lot of pore space in between. Now, that pore space could be filled with air, but if it's on a stream or a creek bank, it's more than likely filled with water, okay? So that's just when you have deposition. But then when you have layer on layer on layer on layer, and the very bottom part, it squeezed those rocks, pushed them closer, closer and closer together until you have very little pore space, and they're really packed down together. You've been squeezing out the water. But, as you squeeze out the water, sometimes that leaves behind some dissolved material that acts like glue, okay? It's a cementing agent, they call it. As the water leaves, it leaves some of this behind, and now these things get stuck together. That's the second part, cementation. So first you have compaction, reducing the thickness of the deposit, uh, mostly because you're reducing the pore size, squeezing out the water, but in the spaces left behind between those sedimentary particles, you now have a chemical deposit which tends to bind things together. A chemical deposit binds the particles and makes them rock, makes them stick together. That's the last phase here. You see the cementation is along the edges of what used to be the force. Okay. Now, two or more 
of the types of sandstone I'll show you. One of them, you can feel the grittiness. You can rub it as much as you want to. You just feel, feel grittiness. The second one, if you rub it at all, you get sand out of it. So that part either wasn't compacted well enough or didn't have enough cementation agent. Okay? I don't know which. I can't tell from here, but uh, obviously did not get lithified as well as the other one. And they both came from pretty much the same areas, I think. All right. Now, before we move to metamorphic rock, um, there are some good pictures in your text, figure 1717, showing some limestone. Sedimentary rock formed underwater, sometimes with the remain of marine organisms in it. You can't see them there, but you can see uh, an illustration. That's on page 448, figure 1717. But guess what? Drive north on I-65, and most of the rock that you look to your right or your left, wherever you see rock where they've cut the highway through, you're going to see limestone. Yeah. Yeah. Are we getting to that point? Or what? Are we heading toward, toward that point? Okay, no. That that you just described is more like you see when they cut through Red Mountain. Why is it called Red Mountain? High iron content. When you see that reddish color, high iron content. Now, it may not be high enough to mine it economically well, but you just have large quantities of iron. Yeah. Yeah, and that ultimately when it breaks down, it's going to form red clay. Same, same type deal. Now, uh, on that, I was going to say this. This limestone looks pretty light. Much of the limestone you see is going to be darkish color, and you might say, why? Well, limestone has pretty good nutrition about it, and you'll get all kinds of uh, molds and lichens and every kind of stuff growing on it. Uh, some of the buildings, I'm trying to think, I think downtown Birmingham has a lot of buildings that are faced with limestone. And if they don't keep those buildings clean, after a while they're streaked with black and stuff because stuff just grows on limestone really well. Okay, It does on other rock too, but limestone has high nutrition for those uh, materials to grow. Now, they have here, and this is an unusual place to put it, the blurb on asbestos. To me, this is a very good read, okay? Um, they mention in here, and you can read this, asbestos is made out of chain silicates, okay, uh, that form fibers, Okay, people now have a fear of all asbestos because it is presumed to be a health hazard. Like it says here, asbestos, cancer and lung disease hazard. Okay, Respir respirators and protective clothing are required in this area because there's asbestos. Read what it says though. However, there are about six commercial varieties of asbestos. Five of these varieties are made from an amphibole material and commercially called brown and blue asbestos. The other variety is made from chrysotil, a serpentine family of minerals. It's commercially called white asbestos. White asbestos is the asbestos mine and most commonly used in North America. It is only the amphibole asbestos, brown and blue asbestos, that has been linked to cancer. So the most commonly mined asbestos in America, in North America, and I believe that Georgia has a fairly good uh, concentration somewhere in South Georgia of asbestos, they don't mine it anymore, even though it's absolutely safe. But because it's the A word, asbestos, no one will touch it, even though the white asbestos is not hazardous 
for a chemical for cancer purposes. Okay. That's why I said it was worth a read. Now, there was a science and society a few pages back on the cost of mining mineral resources. Uh, the one on page 450 is using mineral resources. And uh, they talk here about what I uh, referred to earlier, phosphates, that how necessary that is for growing crops and how dangerously low we're running our phosphate mining. <coughs> and I think uh, Justin or someone said, yeah, but they found new deposits in South Africa or somewhere. So maybe they will find enough to keep us going for a while. But it's all likely to get more and more expensive. So that's another really good one to read. All right. I think we're ready now for metamorphic rock. Okay. The third group of rocks. What's the first two? Igneous, Igneous and, and sedimentary. sedimentary. Perfect. Okay. The third group is metamorphic. When you see the term meta, you can think of change. Morpha means the morphology or the what, how it's put together. Okay. So this is being changed. Metamorphic rock. Okay. Metamorphic rock was previously existing rock that has been changed. Changed by heat, changed by pressure, or changed by hot solutions into distinctively different rock. You'll see some examples of this. Now the causes are associated generally with geologic events. Okay? For instance, movement of the crust. That can cause some very high heat if those the friction between the plates are happening. It can also have enormous pressures put on if one plate's moving under another plate, which does happen. So the movement of the crust. Okay. Also, heating and hot solutions from magma intrusion. Okay. So let's say magma has made its way near the surface and starts heating up the surrounding rock. That could cause the heat that changes those surrounding rocks. Okay? Metamorphosizes those changing rocks. Okay? You could also have temperatures, or oh, the temperatures here must be high enough to cause recrystallization and the pressure great enough to cause recrystallization. But there's a danger because if the temperatures go a little too high, they melt the rock. And if you melt the rock, it goes back to being magma, then it becomes igneous rock. Yeah. Well, I, I guess I, I must have missed a point. Now, okay. Now, how did the metamorphic I thought it was changed? So, why are they changing? Okay. All right. Remember when I was describing what happens when your sedimentation right. on layer on layer on layer, it packs and packs and packs. Okay, that's pressure. Okay? No, no, that's sedimentary. Okay. That's sedimentary. Now, let's have what if you had igneous rock or sedimentary rock or even other metamorphic rock. Okay, that's gotten very, very, very under more and more pressure. Now those crystal structures that made up the previous rock, they get changed, especially if you incorporate in there heat, which could come from magma nearby. Okay. So that's what's happening. It was rock. It wasn't sediment. It was rock. It was okay. rock, okay. and it's gotten in the presence of large amounts of heat, maybe from magma, mm -hmm. uh, or just from friction, or it came from or shifting of the crust, whatever has caused that heat. And also the pressure, layer on layer on layer. So our moving uh, uh, crust, you know, whatever caused that, it now takes the previously existing rock that was made out of crystal structures, heats it, changes it. You know, it's just like when you bake a cake or biscuits or something, what you put in is what comes out, you know, because the heat changes it. And so on. that's a pretty poor example, but, it's, it's, but that metamorphosizes it, it changes it. 
Okay. But if the heat gets too much, it melts it, and now it's magma again. It becomes igneous rock because it comes from magma. So that's the deal. Here are some examples of that. Remember we talked about the shale. What kind of rock was shale? Sedimentary rock. What kind of sedimentary rock was shale? I think it's flint. It's what? It was classic because it was made out of mud, you know, silt, even clay. Not sand. Not sand. Mud, silt, clay. Okay? Very fine. But shale was in layers. Always in layers. Okay? A, um, a plastic sedimentary rock, shale. Under enormous pressures and more and more temp higher and higher temperatures, that shale will turn to slate. Now, can anyone think of what slate is used for? And this, they also do some mining up around, uh, I think around Nashville. And I know up in Pennsylvania, they do it, slate. Roof tiles. Oh, have you ever seen in some of the old, old buildings, they actually have, it's not asbestos tile like or shingles like we have on our house, or metal or something. It is, now it's, neither is it the uh, clay fired, you know, tiles like that. These are actually pieces of rock that have been cut into shingle shapes. We, the church I go to in Southside Birmingham is a pretty old church. The old part of the church has slate, has the shingles. They've been there decades. Now, they do start leaking around them because the, the, they don't connect really well, and you have to go in and, and dab them with whatever... Uh, stuff to keep the water from coming in. So they can be a pain, but you never have to change them because they're rock. They're made out of rock. So that slate, that shale has been compressed. The, 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 uh, the crystals have actually changed to make bigger, harder crystals. That slate. Now, you keep adding heat. You keep adding, and, and by the way, once it changed from shale to slate, even though it's still in layers and everything else, this is now metamorphic rock. Uh, sedimentary, plastic sedimentary rock, metamorphic rock. But if you continue putting more pressure, temperature on that slate, you form schist. Okay? Another metamorphic rock that was made out of a previous metamorphic rock. You've changed the crystal structure again. Now these do not break into sheets as well as slate does. So you can't make, I don't think you can make roofs out of sheets, uh, schist, okay? But then you add more temperature, more pressure to those and you form nice. Nice rock, nice rock. No, no. Okay, uh, remember that picture we saw early on where the layers were all gnarled and crooked? That was nice. That has undergone enormous amounts of heat, temperature, pressure, and stuff that really distorted and, and made all sorts of things, okay? If you keep adding heat and pressure to the nice rock, okay, it actually melts and becomes granite. What kind of rock is granite? Igneous, igneous rock because it melted and went back to being an igneous rock. So, Nice. Igneous, is that the one you're saying? Nice. Nice? nice. Oh, nice. It's G N E I S S. That's a metamorphic rock, also. Metamorphic, yeah. This is uh, plastic, sedimentary, metamorphic, 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 igneous. Because this melted and went back to being igneous rock. Okay. Let's take. Igneous rock is the last stage. Well, it can be. It, quite often it was the first stage, maybe, you know, because it originally was igneous rock, but those plastic pieces came from igneous rock, perhaps. Yes? Our rock formation from the igneous and sedimentary and metamorphic rock can it be like a water cycle? 
reforming? Absolutely. You just hit the last figure in this chapter. Okay? It's called the rock cycle. Just like what you just said. Okay? Now, what is limestone? Sedimentary rock? What kind of sedimentary rock? Chemical sedimentary rock. It came out of solution. Okay? And that's you know, fairly, you know, I mean, it's rock, but it's not all that hard of a rock. Um, but if it goes under a lot of pressure and temperature and stuff, and you recrystallize it, that forms one of my favorites, marble. This is metamorphic rock. Marble is metamorphic. Yes, marble is metamorphic. And granite. Coming from limestone. And granite is igneous again. What's that? Well, you've not got a discerning eye. That's why. No, I'm not. <laughs> uh, well, I'll show you some pictures, some illustrations of it. Uh, granite, you can almost pick out the crystals. Yeah. Uh, a lot of time with lime, uh, with a marble, it's just almost like one. You, you don't really see the crystals so, per se. They're really so compressed together. Almost like they've melted together. What's and this black stream all looking? Yeah, that's just that your biotite that you know rocks have all these other things in them, but the biotite tends to form that's a little bit of iron that's still in there. You know? And uh, yeah, you'll see that in what we're showing. Now you keep adding heat and pressure to marble, and at some point it melts and then becomes calcite crystals again which is goes back to being igneous okay now sandstone what kind of rock is sandstone not chemical plastic because sand particles okay so sandstone is plastic sedimentary rock c-l-a-s-t-i-c plastic that means particles. Yeah, it's just like plastic, but it replaces the T with the C. Okay. Now, you put that under a lot of heat and pressure, then you form a metamorphic rock called quartzite. Sand made from quartz. This is a metamorphic rock named quartzite. Now, there are some countertops that are quartzite, but there's also countertops that are sandstone that have been polished to look like quartzite. And then there's some artificially made ones that you do it too. Okay? But if you take that quartzite, the metamorphic quartzite, put it under more and more and more heat and pressure. If you add too much heat, it melts it, and it comes back being quartz, which is igneous. When the quartz re, uh, goes from uh, magma back to being, uh, you know, solid, you lose it. Okay. So the next we use the next, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the next line is do the same thing, but it starts from igneous and going back down. Say again? Oh, okay, yeah, the next one. Okay. Yeah. Now this is a fine grained igneous rock. Are you having to leave now? You want to go and get the lab? Please. Okay. Can we take a very quick break here? What time is it anyway? 2.58. Is what? 2.58. 2.58. Okay. Uh, so let me go on and let's take a break. Uh, we've been... Uh, I am amazed you turn on the projector. Yeah. Y'all are worth it. Okay. I've been meaning to do this for several days. I just keep forgetting because we don't have all that much spare time. Just a reminder, folks, that's why I'm recording for people listening at home, too. Lab one, I still have one, two, three, four people who have not turned in lab one. As soon as I get lab one in, all of them, I'm returning them to you, okay? Test one, I still have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people haven't taken test one. As soon as you can take test one, I get them all in, those are going back to you. I'm not going to wait till the end of the term, but I wait till they all come in. Lab two, 
while I'm on a roll here. Lab two, one person has not turned in lab two. So as soon as I get, no, two people, sorry. Uh, two people have to turn in lab two. As soon as I get those two in, then I'll be giving those back to you. Test two. Okay. Test two is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine people haven't done test two. As soon as I get those in, I'll get your, those back to you. Lab three. Nobody turned that in because that's the one you're doing on the moon. It's going to take two weeks. What's that? Okay, it's up in the sky. Okay. I, okay. okay. Somebody told me that he went out fairly early and saw a very fine crescent, very small yeah. crescent, and then a little bit later it disappeared. That mean that was going down with the sun. Oh, so just a little bit later, it'll be up there. So I keep watching night after night. Some point you'll see it. Uh huh. Say that again. Lab three? Yeah. Okay, does anyone else need the moon lab? Lab. Okay. Wait just a second. I'm sorry. <laughs> Need what? New lab. New lab. Huh? You just asked lab three. Yeah, you just asked if anybody needs new lab. The moon lab. That's what I was saying. Is that what you mean? I need that one too. Okay. There's one. So the moon, that's the one you're still on? What's that? The moon, that's the one you're still on? That's the one. I said the moon, is that the one you're still on? No, y'all are still working on that. The moon. Yeah, the moon lab. But we did most of that in class, so if you listen to the YouTube video, you'll get most of that. Does anyone else need lab three, which is the moon lab? Yes. Okay. The one to the planetarium is off because they're not doing any shows. Okay. They don't have a director for it. Okay, okay I've heard that this morning. Okay, the, the weather station still is coming up, and unless there's bad weather that week or we just can't schedule it with Jerry Tracy, we'll be having that one. But that's near the end of the term, probably latter part of February. Okay, yes? So Uh huh. Even this morning, even. <laughs> and what? Anyway, even, even this morning around eight or nine o'clock, I saw the moon and the star, and that particular star with the sun in the same part of the sky. Uh huh. See, the moon is. Uh, if you think about what we talked about with the moon, a new moon is always going to be near the sun, because a new moon is when you see the backside of it. Now it's beginning to separate. Either one way or the other, it's getting closer or it's getting further. Is the crescent getting a little bigger every night? Slightly? Okay, well then, yeah. At some point, it'll be, at whatever time you're watching, at some point, it'll be. Now, if you're early morning, that may be setting, and if it's late in the evening, it may be rising. But, you know, uh, so catch it when you can. Yeah. Let me ask you you say it is. Yes, yes, yes. You pick the time that you can do it and, and do it, but it's not every night. It's every other night. Unless you have a bad night, then do the next night. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, so to answer your question, as soon as I get all the labs or all the tests, of any one of them in, I'll give them back to you. But if I still haven't gotten them by the end of the term, the last day of class, they're all going back, and everybody who hasn't turned in that one, that's a zero. So please get them in as soon as you can. Okay? All right. Now.
Yeah. 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 So if you can uh, identify those people you know have a taken, get on their case. Okay. Okay. Brenda's right. Okay. And I will try to be getting on their case as well. Like I said, I've been trying to do this, but last week, we, or Tuesday, I had the eye appointment, so we didn't have lots of spare time. Okay, we've been talking about metamorphic rock. I think we pretty much beat this one to death. Um, on the same page, that on page 451, or whatever the page number is on, in your book, that you see this table here, 1719, there's also a blurb on Victor Moritz Goldschmidt. Okay, uh, he was a Swiss-born Norwegian chemist uh, who has been called the father of modern geochemistry. Uh, pretty interesting, uh, right up there. This can't be your source for if you choose him for a paper, but this could get ideas. But if you read that, you'll see Josiah Gibbs is also mentioned there, he would be a potential paper topic. William and Lawrence Bragg, Max von Laue, uh, there's several people mentioned here, and uh, there are a few theories or other things that you might want to write on them as well. So there's a whole lot of stuff in that one little article. Uh, so just a hint. Get working on your papers. Oh, let's see, I mentioned everything else, but how many papers have been turned in? Zero, okay. Hey, this is a mini term. Please get moving on your papers. Yes. Do you have like a rubric or something for the paper on blackboard? No, all I need is you write it, you know. Yeah. How does it turn the paper in? I'm sorry? Okay, uh, I thought I'd answer this before, but I'm glad to answer it again. I grade what I get, okay? Now, I've had some people, it doesn't happen often, but I've had some people email me a paper, and when I print it off, I say, I know they don't want it in this format, okay? I've had a couple times people, everything is center justified, not standard. They, they center justified the title and forgot to take that off and didn't notice when they were typing everything was center justified. False some points, okay? So I think it's a good idea for you to see your paper. Yes, that's how I want it to look. Yeah, I'm going to turn that in. But if you want to email it to me, I'll accept it, but I grade what I get. So I'll leave it like that. Yes. No, go ahead. Okay, but if you go back and read or listen to my instructions when I went over them on the first day of class, or read them, the ones that are out there, things like spelling, grammar, all that count off, content counts off, just, just you know, do me the best paper you can. You choose your topic, and you write it up however you want to, uh, as long as it's making sense and done well, you are not got anything to worry about. Okay. And do you think that is as soon as possible? Or okay, yes, as soon as possible. And we went over that and the thing, too. If you turn it in the month of January, which you have today and tomorrow left, you get two bonus points. If you turn... Oh, yeah, it was out there. If you turn it in the first three weeks in February, you get one bonus point. And if you turn it in that last week in February, you just get your grade. If you turn it in after the last day of class, then you start losing points. Okay. So please, sooner the better, but it's not technically due till the last day of class. But please get it done sooner. Yes. How many sources again? I'm sorry? How many sources again? How many choices? Sources. Sources. Oh, one to two or three. I mean, anything. You have to have at least one. More is better. Okay, but at least one. Outside source doesn't count the book. Okay. All right, one last thing to talk about metamorphic rock is how we classify. Remember, we classified igneous rock by whether it was intrusive or extrusive. 
We also classified whether it was ferrous or non -ferro uh, ferromagnetic or non-ferrous. Okay, there were several ways to classify. Uh, sedimentary rock, classic or it's chemical. Several ways to do that. Now, metamorphic rock is basically one classification. It has several pieces to it, but it's foliation. Okay? What word, what do you think of when you see the word foliation? Foliage, which is what? Huh? Oil is another good one. Okay? What is that? What does foliage and foil have in common? Say again? Okay, aluminum foil. What does that have in common with foliage? Flowers or something. Okay. Foliage. Foliage are basically leaves. They come in sheets. Aluminum foil is in sheets. If you have a portfolio, that's a collection of your works in sheets. That's what folio means. So foliation is alignment of flat crystal flakes into sheets. And that's how we classify metamorphic rock. Now, it's caused by that pressure on those parent rocks. Remember, metamorphic rock was some other rock before, and the pressure and the heat changed it. The rock cleaves along those planes between the aligned grains. For instance, shale to slate. Really highly foliated. But we have some other non-foliated metamorphic rock. The parent rock consists mainly of one mineral, and the grains are not aligned in the sheets, so it's a three-dimensional structure. Generally, marble is like that. Okay? Slate is like this. Okay? And you have other uh, gradations of them. So here's how we classify our foliation. Non-foliated, things like quartzite or marble. Both of those are three-dimensional stru crystal structure. You don't have any sheeting going on in that at all. You have very finely foliated you can separate that, that uh, I mean, that's very easily separated and very thin sleeps. That slate, finely foliated, is schist, and coarsely foliated, remember that one that's all gnarly? That's your nice, nice rock, okay? Uh, so those would be examples of the four classification of foliation. Non-foliated or very finely foliated, finely foliated or very coarsely or coarsely foliated. Okay. The slate, she can break into things and make shingles out of it. I mean, that's finely, finely foliated. And it all comes from the rock, uh, the pressure uh, forming sheets of rock as opposed to three-dimensional rock. Yes? Slate has a lot of variation in color. Like it's high heat. Yes. Um, you can have, uh, uh, if you remember back when we talked about properties of minerals, right. we said color is the most variable thing. You can have, uh, and just think of things that are common. Just think of all the diamonds you own. Not well, I'm just kidding. Okay. Uh, you can have the very clear crystal diamond. Mm -hmm. You can have pink diamond. Yellow diamond, black diamond, brown diamond. I mean, there's just a whole variety of them. And the reason is you have just little traces of impurities that change the way it looks. So color is not a great discriminator because it's you can have a wide variety. When you do your lab today, the first category you're going to mention is color. And I think you'll be amazed by any one mineral all the different colors it can have. Now, there's a few minerals that only come in one, one size, shape, or form, but most of them have a wide range of colors. So color is not a good thing to try to discriminate your, your minerals from because they can just be all over the place. So you're absolutely right. Have a wide variety of colors. Okay, are people still...
copying this? You got it? No, you still work? Okay. Okay. Here is that same uh, slide we just had, only made smaller, so I don't know why they did that. Here is a piece of marble. Now, this isn't polished marble, but uh, it's a coarse grain metamorphic rock with interlocking calcite crystals. You can't pick out them, except you can see they're there, but they interlock, and that's what makes it so hard. But it also makes it very brittle. Marble can chip easily. Well, not easily, but when it chips, it chips, okay? It fractures pretty easily. The calcite crystals uh, were recrystallized from limestone during your metamorphosis. So that's marble. Polish it, and it's just gorgeous, okay? Here's that same picture we saw earlier on a bigger scale. This is that nice rock, okay? The banded metamorphic rock is... Uh, very something or other. Old, uh, of an age of about 3.8 billion years old. I'd say that's fairly old. Okay. Probably right around the time. It had to have been enough after that for there to be some plastic sedimentation, and then you had plastic uh, sedimentary rock, and then later it was metamorphosized to this. See, this, the layers are. They have been under such high pressures and temperatures, they've gotten all out of the line. Gorgeous piece of rock. Okay? But in other words, the word foliage, foliated, comes from the word leaf. Okay. Your book has a couple of other uh, banded, uh, in fact, your figure 1720 is the same rock here is just taken from a different perspective. And your 1721 is just another view of a different piece of marble. Okay. So, anyway. Now, everybody got it? Or still writing? Okay. Justin jumped ahead of us. Here comes the rock cycle. This is what rock stars ride when they drop. No, no, that's different. Okay. Now, rocks are transformed into new types by Earth's interior and exterior dynamical processes. What's going on inside the Earth? Shifting. Plate tectonics, we're going to talk about in the next chapter. All this stuff is happening. Exterior, you got wind, you got water, you got other things going on, always changing everything. It's slow, but it's happening, okay? So rocks are always being transformed into new types by the Earth's interior and exterior dynamical processes. You have the moving continents, plate tectonics. You have seeds coming in and seas retreating. You have uh, heat. You have all sorts of things. You have weathering and erosion by wind, by rain, glaciers. All these things are happening constantly. Not all at the same rate, not all at the same time, but they're always happening. Okay, and this is actually one of my favorite diagrams. It looks really squirrely, but it really shows everything. All rocks started as igneous rock. So let's start with igneous rock. This igneous rock can erode, in other words, water, wind, Temperatures, various things. We'll talk about this in a couple of chapters from now. The erosion pro weathering process. That igneous rock will break down into small pieces. Those small pieces could be sand pieces, they could be clay pieces, they could be silt pieces, they could be gravel pieces. But anyway, those pieces could then settle out and become sediments. Okay? Then the lithification process, what are the two stages of lithification? Compaction and cementation. Excellent. The two C words. And then they, that sediment becomes sedimentary rock. Well, guess what? The sedimentary rock can also weather and erode and go back to being segments, sediments again. Or they could go under more temperature and pressure 
and metamorphosize to become metamorphic rock, like limestone to uh, marble, like sandstone to quartzite. I mean, lots of ways it can do that. Okay? This metamorphic rock could then weather away and become sediments again. Okay? Or it could get more heat, actually melt, become magma, becomes igneous rock again. Or, I left off this one, the igneous rock could metamorphosize under heat and pressure and become different ones, like quartz becoming quartzite, okay? And then that can go back. So there's all sorts of short-circuiting. Everything goes around and around. That's why they call it a cycle. And ultimately, everything becomes igneous rock again over long periods of time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any questions on that? Do you need a little more time? And that does, if I'm not mistaken, in the slideshow. Okay? Now, I'll say it every time, nothing replaces reading the chapters. Please, if you haven't already, the best idea is to read it before I talk about it. But if you don't, read it afterwards. It'll make things come together a lot better. Your summary summarizes the chapter, especially those words that are italicized. Uh, those are important to focus on. This summary is maybe about average length, maybe a tad short of average. Key terms, that's sort of a short list. They're given alphabetically, but they do list them by page number where they're... Uh, first shown up or defined. But the best thing to study is the applying the concepts. There's 43 questions here, which may be a little short of normal, uh, all multiple choice. If you know these, you know most of the content that you'll need. Not the same questions, but the same content is being tested here and what you'll see on your test. Okay, there are questions for thought, 19 in this, that's more than normal. Those are good to look at, too. For further analysis, we've only got four, which may be a little short of normal. And speaking of which, here is Kaya. Okay. And it's 3.31. Just barely made it in through the class time. Okay. And then there's invitation to inquiry. You can read that if you're interested. The parallel exercises, again, I don't think are that useful in this course, but you can certainly look at those if you choose. All right, any questions? Chapter 17. So since we did finish the chapter today, that means in about 15 minutes we'll start the lab for Chapter 17, uh, which also means next Tuesday the last 30 minutes will be the test on 17. So everybody heard that, okay? Now... What we'll do from now on, for the next 15 minutes or so, let's start chapter 18. Just give you a general overview of what 18 is going to be. It really builds on 17, okay? In fact, these next several chapters all intertwine like crazy, okay? So here we have chapter 18. The topic, the title of it is Plate tectonics okay and these are some pretty pictures but you don't really see why it has anything to do with plate tectonics maybe by the end you might see that a little better okay here is the core concept which is also listed on my page 458 whatever that is in your book earth has an internal structure and guess what it cycles materials between the surface and the interior now, this is not a rapid process. Usually, it's usually a pretty slow process, okay? Now, the figure at the bottom here, we're going to talk about later in the chapter when it's a lot bigger. Uh, going to take up almost the whole page. But these are the major plates that the Earth's surface is made of, okay? I'll just point them out to you. The North American plate here is where we live. There's a Eurasian plate, huge plate here, Europe and most of Asia. 
There's the African plate here. Uh, it's front, no, I'm sorry, here, with the edge of it here. The South American plate here. The Indo Indian Australian plate here. Who would have thought it that India was not part of Eurasian plate, but part of the its own plate, India uh, Australian plate? So why is it not a continent with the Africa plate? What's that? So why is it not a continent with the Africa plate? Well, part of it's underwater. <laughs> I mean, it's just this this part of the, and it's not just the crust. It's beyond the crust. This is all connected. Here's the Philippine plate here, the Arabian plate here. Much of that is Saudi Arabia, but there are other countries that are in it too. Uh, here's the Caribbean plate, fairly small one. The Nazca plate down here, pretty active plate here. Here's the Pacific plate. You have the Antarctic plate down here. The Arctic is pretty much split up between North America and Eurasia. Uh, there is a tiny little plate here called the Juan de Fuca plate. And yet it causes a lot of issues. Okay. So. Again. Wherever there's land, you're gonna have tectonic plates. Okay. And you don't. Okay. Or of course that's true. But some of that land may be below water. That's true. Like the Pacific plate is all below water. The Filipino plate is much. Well, I say all. There are islands in the Pacific. Okay. But yeah, the, the whole surface of the Earth is split into these plates. Everything, underwater, above water, whatever. And not always is a continent on one plate. For instance, uh, India is a separate plate from, from uh, Nepal and, and China. Uh, and the Arabian plate, Saudi Arabia, even though it's connected by land, is on a separate plate. Okay. So, yeah, it's pretty interesting stuff. So let's look at a brief history of the Earth's interiors. This is 18.1 in the chapter. Now, yeah, we think the Earth was formed about 4.6 billion years ago when we were in that solar nebula. Okay, the sun was blowing up and trying to stabilize, and we got blown out there, and then finally sort of formed up about 4.6 billion years ago. Now, if you remember back. That piece of nice rock that we saw, 3.8 billion. So the Earth hadn't even been around a billion years yet. Sounds like a long time, but that was way back there. The early Earth, early Earth, when it was forming then, was a molten surface, melted on the surface, mostly from bombarding material. Remember, the sun was exploding. You know, I mean, it was a mess back then. And because all that stuff was flying around in that band around the, the sun, the earth was molten. It was, it was all volcanic rock, basically. Okay? But sometime after that 4.6 million years, the surface began to cool, and it crystallized because it had all been molten. Every rock there was igneous rock. Every one, because it came from molten material. Now... The heat accumulated from radioactive decay led to a second melting, but this time of the interior. This was mostly because of radioactive decay, because remember those explosions of the sun were atomic explosions. You know, they were radioactive explosions. Okay? So there was a lot of radioactive material there, so it was uh, that radioactive decay, most of that stuff got settled interior, and that made melting of the interior. The melting occurred in pockets, not throughout the interior. Okay? Now we'll be talking more about this a little bit later, so hang on to the concepts here. Okay? Now this led to what they call differentiation. That means differences in layers and in way things are put together. The melting and the gravitational settling of the heavy materials went toward the center of the Earth, and it gave its present stratified structure. Now we're going to talk about that stru stru stratified structure soon. We're going to start it right here. The outer core of the Earth is still molten, and it's mostly iron. Okay, so the core, the core of the Earth 
has an inner core which is solid and an outer core which is molten, melted. Okay? Now, conditions at the Earth's center, the inner core, way down there. The pressure, 3.5 million atmospheres of pressure. Just to give you an idea what an atmosphere of pressure is, okay, your two thumb joints like that, basically when you hold them to look like that, that's basically a square inch, right? So your thumb is about an inch long, two of them together is about an inch wide. So there's a square inch, okay? Normal atmospheric pressure is close to 15 pounds for every square inch on the surface of the Earth. 15 pounds, that's one atmosphere of pressure for every square inch. Think about how many square inches are in your body. That's how, multiply that by 15, 14.7 actually, that gives you how much force is on your body, okay? That's a lot, but you see your body's pressing out with the same, it's in fact even more force, okay? Uh, now, that's one atmosphere of pressure. Multiply that by 3.5 million, that's the pressure at the center of the Earth. That is a lot of pressure. The temperature is around 6,000 degrees Celsius. That's hot. <laughs> that is really hot. 100 degrees Celsius is boiling water. 6,000 is, it would be hot enough to melt the center of the Earth, except it's under so much pressure, it doesn't, it stays a solid, okay? So that's a, a really incredibly hostile environment. So the science fiction movie that came out many years ago, Journey to the Center of the Earth, fiction, more fiction than science, okay? Not much science in it, maybe a little bit. You're not going to get to the center of the Earth. You're going to be toast before you get there, way before you get there. And you couldn't get through all of it anyway. So anyway, that's beginning of the history of the Earth's interior. Okay, no, y'all are still writing? Okay. Can we go in the lab today? What's that? Yeah, we're going to start the lab at uh, 345. What time is it? 341. 341. Four minutes. Okay. All right. Anyway, I, I, we had a break not long ago. I got water. Okay, but if you need more, go get it, you know. Yeah, I had I got me some water and a sip of Coke, too. I just need a little more energy. Okay. Still writing? Okay. Okay. So... Earth as we know it, we talked about in the last chapter, a very thin crust, and then at the very center, a solid core, and around that, a melted core. So two parts of the core, okay? The outer core, mostly iron. We do iron mining on the surface, and we think we've got something special. If you were able to dig down any distance into the earth, you're going to hit mostly iron. Yeah. So what calls the mental, the mental? What calls the spot? Why do they call it the mental, the mental? Why do they call it that? I have no idea. Okay. We'll talk about what the mantle is coming up. I was just waiting for people to finish the slide. Are we still on it? Finish it? Oh. All righty. So. How do we know this much about the Earth's internal structure? No one's gone down there. I just said, journey to the center of the Earth. Fiction! You can't go down there. So how do we deduce what the Earth's internal structure is? Three, four major things and some minor things underneath those. So they're all fairly major. The first of these, the fact that the Earth has a magnetic field. Why would that give you any indication of the Earth's internal structure? Well, the only way you get a magnetic field, this is the first half of the book, is if you have a moving charge. Moving charges. Well, the Earth is spinning, so that's where things are 
that gives you your motion, what gives you the charge, the fact that the outer part of the earth, and you mentioned the mantle, the mantle is the, the innermost part of the mantle is still solid, the outermost part of the core is still, is liquid, is, is molten, so when those are rubbing past each other, which happens when the earth spins, then you knock off electrons, as the electrons are spinning in the earth, that's what gives us a magnetic field. And it's significant. It's a measurable magnetic field, so there has to be a lot. So that's one thing that indicates, yes, we have to have that outer solid and inner liquid. The gravity effects. We know, by Newton's formula, how much mass the Earth must have to give us the force due to gravity that we've got. We know the density of stuff on the surface. The density of the interior must be much greater to give us those gravitational effects. And they have all sorts of great computer modeling that tells you how it has to be put together to give you that effect. Another is heat flow. We know approximately the temperature in the center of the Earth, or at least we've deduced it. Uh, we know the heat of the magma that comes up when we have volcanic reactions. Okay, let me finish the slide then. We follow and measure how the heat flows through these various materials so we we can hypothesize what those materials must be. So the nucleus is what's happening down there in the center of the earth, right? Science yeah, of course. No one's been down there, but these are educated guesses. Yeah, they're guesses, but they're very well educated guesses. Now, this one gives us an incredible amount of information about how the Earth is put together, the vibrations of the Earth. Now, what causes these vibrations? Earthquakes, okay? Nuclear explosions will too. Hopefully we don't have many of those, but they aren't as good. The earthquakes, they give us a lot of information. These radiate outward from the earthquakes, these seismic waves, We'll talk about three types of seismic waves, okay? We'll talk about those coming up. And we also can note nuclear explosions because they are almost not as powerful as earthquakes, but you can detect them. Because from the earthquakes, we have developed uh, seismographs, which measure these, and they're all over the earth. Every country has them, and they share the data. Science is really the best place for people coming together and sharing. It doesn't matter what the political philosophies are and other things. Science really unites people. And there's two things. Tsunami uh, sharing and seismic sharing are two of the premier ways we do this. And that's why if anyone sets off a nuclear explosion, everybody knows. They look at that and say, oh, that wasn't an earthquake. That must have been a nuclear explosion. So people who do nuclear testing when they're not supposed to, they get called. Okay. So anyway, we will move from this slide to that one. The one talking about seismic waves here, that's where we pick up next time. Okay. Now, first thing I want to do is mark the roll again. Bridget never made it in today. Brianna hasn't made it in today. Jerome is mostly here, okay. Asia was back, right, okay. Jacob is still here. Kaya is still here. Rakaria is still here. Justin is mostly here. Sherlanda is still here. But Tarsha, surprisingly, hasn't made it in today. It's the first time she's been absent. Uh, Eric is still back there. Zach is still over there. Katie hasn't made it in yet today. Brandis is still here, back in the corner. Miss Lewis is still here. Antonio is... Yeah, there you are. You moved back one. Okay. Uh... No, David is still here. I was looking for you sitting in the last class, and you weren't there. Tiffany is still here. 
Kaylee had to leave. Donald is still here. And Shakaya is still here. Okay? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. 3, 6, 7, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. Got it. Okay. Now, if you want to, you can take a, another quick break. I saw you had to have two today. Because uh, I've got to go find the lab for you. Okay? So you can start reading the lab. Take one and pass two. Take one and pass three. Take one and pass three. No, I'll make it four. Okay, wait just a moment for me to get a copy of the Moon Lab. Anyone else need a Moon Lab? Let me pause this. Okay. This off. Okay. I'm sorry? I'm not trying to interrupt. Well, on the lab where it says cleavage slash fracture, do you want to put okay. the cleavage? Okay. Let me, let me get this up and then I'll explain that. Okay? All right. Okay. No. Okay. All right, we're recording again, so I can start answering some of the questions. Okay. Okay, first. For anyone that were not in it to, or can't read it, let me write down the website. Okay? Okay, let me get my pen set up. Okay, the website you go to for today's lab, this is the Properties of Common Minerals. I, I, yeah, that's right, you can't see it, but this is for home, people at home. Is web, W-E-B, M-I-N-E, R-A-L dot com. Okay? Now, if you put an S on it, you'll go to a different site, and that won't have the information you need. Okay, once you get to webmineral.com, then you'll see in one of the tabs there, it says A to Z, right? Click on that tab, and then you get an alphabetical choice. Your first mineral was calcite. So click on the C tab and then just scroll down, scroll down, scroll down there in alphabetical order until you get the calcite. Once you get calcite, then you have to scroll down. What you're looking for is the subtopic that says physical properties of minerals. Isn't that right? Okay. And when you get that one, 
then you'll see the a listing of just about everything that is listed in our table. Okay? Now, I'm getting the table so I can look at it and make sure I say everything correctly. Okay. Okay. It's physical properties of the crystals. Okay? Now, I want to point something out to you. Is everybody listening? Okay? On the page 331 of your lab, there is a question there. But that question you answer at the end. Don't answer at the beginning. Wait until you finish. But don't forget to go back to 331 and answer that question. Okay? If it's blank, you don't get credit for it. All right. So the first mineral is calcite. You found the physical properties of calcite, right? Now, they won't be in the same order, but somewhere in there you see the listing of color. Now, I've already had some people ask questions about this. What, how many do you list? List at least three. List more if you want to, just to give an idea how many colors it can have. Now, a few of them may only have one or two colors, so list what they give you. Okay? Now, luster is generally listed. Okay? That's usually going to be one word. Metallic, glassy, vitreous, uh, pearly, you know, something like that. So that's usually going to only be one word. Streak is probably listed somewhere near color. So on that one, on that one, there's usually just one color there. White, black, green, brown, whatever. Streak, there's usually only one color. All right. Now on the next page, you're going across the page, still with calcite, it asks for hardness. Now hardness is usually listed in two ways. One is a number, and the other may be a uh, descriptor, like another mineral, or it'll be something like fingernail or knife blade or something like that. You can list either of those or both. doesn't take much to list them both. Now, the question I just had, are you listening, Donald? Donald? Oh, you, okay. On cleavage slash fracture, usually there's two different categories there. So I want you to list a little bit about what it says about cleavage, okay? It may say none. If it says none, put none. But it probably is going to say something about cleavage. Then do the slash about halfway through the block and list what it says about fracture. Whatever it says about fracture, list a little bit of that. You may not be able to write it all, but list something about cleavage slash something about f fracture. Do enough for me to understand. Sometimes the cleavage will just be a series of numbers. 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 3, uh, you know, something like that. If that's what they've got, list it. It may say perfect 1, 1, 0 or something like that. So list a little bit of what they say about cleavage slash a little bit of what they say about fracture. Now this next one, please, everybody, listen up. Other means density. The most important classification, they didn't put it on the lab. So that's what I want you to put under other is either density or specific gravity. If it gives density, put density. If it gives specific gravity, put specific gravity. Does everybody understand that last column is not whatever you want to put? It's density and or specific gravity. Okay. Any questions on what you're to write? Now, this is a question that you haven't asked yet, but you will. Okay. I think you'll find calcite, magnetite, Pyrite, hematite, limonite. When you get there, I think that's one of them. You may not find limonite. Okay? If you don't, and I know if you don't find limonite, feldspar. I know that one for sure. You're not going to find feldspar. So any that you can't find in your alphabetic table there, then what you need to do is go out for just a moment Go on a search engine, Google or whatever, and type in the name that you're looking for, like feldspar. <clears throat> and then you'll get a listing of minerals that are all feldspar. 
Okay, then go back to your table and see if you can find one of those minerals. If you find one that's listed under feldspar, then write it over feldspar. Same thing with limonite. Same thing with bauxite. Okay, there's several of these that you may not find in the list. That's the most comprehensive list I've found, but there's still a few missing. Because feldspar isn't a mineral. Feldspar is a class of minerals. So pick a mineral, any mineral that's feldspar, write it above there, and then give me the descriptions for that mineral. Does that make sense? Yes, I do. Any questions? Okay. Now what I'm going to do is put my computer on hold, the, the, the recorder on hold, and I'm going up to the lab and get some samples of these minerals. Now, I kind of hate to bring them in here because it's such a nice floor in here, but I'll probably keep them at the back somewhere. Please, they are messy. They make a mess, so don't get your tables all messy. But come take a look at those minerals. They're pretty incredible. Any questions before I go? Okay. Uh, huh? Yes. Yeah. Of the colors. No, you do every mineral on here. But some of these minerals aren't minerals. They're classes of minerals. So something like feldspar, go find a mineral that's listed feldspar that you can find in your table and then write up that. But yeah, you do every one as many as you can. Now, there may be some that you don't see, say, cle cleavage on. If you don't see it, put none, okay? Or look it up in... Uh, Google it and see if you find the cleavage for hematite, okay, or whatever, fracture for hematite. But just about everything on here you should be able to find. If you can't, ask me and I'll try to help you find it, okay? All right, uh, any other questions? Okay, I'm going to put this on pause.